you're watching Gears. Brought to you by Holly Performance Products. Fuel your passion. And Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals. In the early 1960s, the hot rod movement was in full swing. Drag strips were springing up all over the place. Hot rods were being built in backyards and roaming the streets at night. And muscle cars were just starting to hit dealerships. Yeah, it was a great time to be a car person. However, as influential as all of that was, there was another phenomenon coming out of Southern California that would hit the automotive world like a fiberglass tsunami. Man, it would completely change the way people buy parts in the aftermarket, and it would create a whole new industry that eventually became known as the kit car industry. Obviously, I'm talking about the Myers-Manx dune buggy. Man, who didn't want one of these things? Now, riding up and down on beaches or ripping around on sand dunes is something that hot rod surfer dudes have been doing for years. And the vehicles they used were wild, home-built contraptions that were usually based off of a Jeep or a truck. So they were heavy and they were cumbersome. But that all changed when a surfer with boat building experience named Bruce Meyer created a one-piece lightweight body out of thick fiberglass and bolted the front and rear suspension and dry train from a Volkswagen Beetle to it. And the fiberglass dune buggy was born as the Myers Manx. And Bruce began offering kits to build one yourself. However, Bruce quickly discovered that using the fiberglass body as a monocoque was too costly to build. So he redesigned the kit so it would bolt down on a shortened Volkswagen Beetle chassis, making construction of a Manx a very simple process for the average person and kits begin to sell. One of the things that made the dune buggy so unique is the styling. I mean, you had these big arched fenders back here so you could put big old tires, whether they were big wide rollers like this or big off-road tires. Then you had seating for up to five people, provided those five people were fairly small or they hit the salad bar on a regular basis. Then, of course, you had a stance and a face that it just made people smile. I mean, girls thought it was cute, guys thought it was cool, and everybody could agree that this was the ultimate fun in the sun vehicle. Available with a big metal flake buried deep within the gel coat, the 11 piece kit didn't even need to be painted. And for around 500 bucks, it became a great personal expression vehicle. For example, this Manx is sitting on a 64 Beetle chassis, has 65 Impala tail lights, a hot 2110 Volkswagen engine with twin MP carbs, and the classic big and little wheel and tire combination with vintage Krager mags making it the perfect cruising around car for those hot August nights. And since all of these cars were built by the individual owners, no two buggies are exactly alike. That's cool. But the Manx wasn't just a fun run around vehicle. No, with its lightweight and rear mounted air cooled engine, these were actually a serious off road vehicle as evidenced by this picture in 1966 on the cover of Hot Rod Magazine with Bruce himself getting all four tires in the air. When people saw that picture, dune buggy fever got even hotter. Then later in 1967, Bruce and co-driver Ted Mangles won the first Mexican 1000 in record time to further propel the Manx dune buggy into iconic status and create even more automotive frenzy. After that, the world seemed to go dune buggy crazy. They began to appear in movies with everybody from Steve McQueen to Elvis driving them. Model kits, die casts, even cartoons featured the nimble buggies that everybody wanted to own or cruise around in. Unfortunately, this is where things started to unravel for Bruce. Because even though he had a design patent on this thing, that didn't stop other companies from ripping off the design and building their own version of the dune buggy. And they saturated the market with it. Also, the government wanted their piece of the kit car pie. So they started leveling all kinds of regulations at kit car manufacturers. And that eventually put Bruce out of business in 1971. But he left quite a legacy because over 6,000 of these things were built and that means they are highly desirable today, especially ones in this kind of shape. But there is a happy ending here 
Because once the kit car market got past the ugly 70s and all those fake Bugattis, high quality kits and component cars started to hit the market. And that's why you can now buy truck bodies and Jeep bodies and Broncos out there. If you're into sports cars, you can get a Cobra or a Cheetah or a Ferrari or a GT40. There's also a slew of muscle car bodies out there, as well as street rod bodies, both in steel and fiberglass. And they're all designed for you to be able to build your dream vehicle in your garage from the ground up and have it be street legal. Man, that is a huge privilege. And that's a privilege we owe to Bruce Meyer and his Manx, the original kit car and still the most popular. And now it's time for another quick tip. If you work on cars very much, you know that eventually you are going to have to have some extra leverage to break loose some stubborn bolts. And there's a whole line of ratchet handles out there to give you that. But not everybody has the budget to afford all of these ratchets. So this is the one that most people use. And the general idea is to take a piece of pipe and put it on the handle and use that for leverage to break loose bolts. But the problem with this is you got to find the pipe, you got to cut it to length, and then when you slide it on the handle, you got this going on, and that can be a little dicey. Fortunately, there's a solution right in your toolbox. Just take a deep weld socket, slide it over the handle, take an extension, pop it in, and you just created a long-handled ratchet. The idea is the same with a half-inch drive. Use the deep weld socket, and the extension, you got the same thing going there. Now, there is some common sense involved here. Obviously, these sockets were not designed to twist like this, and that little nub does not have the torsional strength of that whole shaft. So, if you're cranking on bolts all the time that require this kind of leverage, man, you need to invest in the proper length ratchet handles. But for those times that come along once in a while, where you need just a little bit of extra leverage, this tip will work for you every time. If you'd like to learn more tips to make your life easier in the shop, check out the tips page on the website. And now, Paint Tech. Brought to you by KBS Coatings. Rust stopped here. You know, there's one four-letter word that truly describes the trials and tribulations of working on cars and trucks, and that is rust. Because this stuff is so destructive, it can take a nice piece of metal like this and turn it into a total piece of junk in just a short period of time. And a lot of times, you don't even know this is going on until it's too late. Now, in the past, we've shown you how to cut out old rusty metal and replace it with new metal. But what if your metal's not rusted out? What if it's just got surface rust on it? Is it possible to save this kind of metal and stop the rusting process? Well, it is, if you use the right products and techniques. That's what we're gonna show you. Okay, the first things we have to understand are the levels of rust and what causes it. When somebody says something is rusted out, that's what that means. It means the metal is gone. It's completely rotten and it needs to be fixed. And the only way to fix that properly is to come up into solid metal, cut out the rusty part and replace it with good metal. Obviously, you don't ever want to put Bondo on with a butter knife like this over a rusted out area. It's just a mess and it's not a good repair. It will always come back to haunt you. Obviously, this is the extreme version of rust out. But what if it's just light rust like this on the surface? Obviously, that is called surface rust, and that's not hurting anybody. But if you let that go, it eventually gets worse. It starts to pit, and it gets deeper, and eventually those pits turn into pinholes, and you end up with rusted out metal eventually. So the idea is to stop that process while you still have good metal. Here's how to do it. The first step is to clean the surface of all loose rust and contaminants. This will require a special cleaner like this KBS Clean and scrubbing with a Scotch-Brite pad or a wire brush or sandpaper. Something to dig in and clean the surface for proper adhesion. You do not have to remove all the old rust, just the loose stuff. The next step is to prep the surface. And for that, we're using this Rust Blast because it's designed to not only convert and neutralize the existing rust, but also etch the surface for adhesion. 
and it's just a matter of spraying it on, letting it sit for a few minutes, and rinsing it off. Okay, once it's all dry, you're ready to seal the surface, and obviously, not just any paint is gonna do this. What we're using is this stuff called Rust Seal, and it's a single stage paint that's designed to seal metal and stop rust forever by preventing air and moisture from getting to the metal and causing rust. Now, this kind of paint is very unique in that it is permanent, but it will not crack or chip either, which means once it's cured, no solvent's gonna take it off. So keep it off your skin and your clothes. And that's all there is to sealing up rust on frames and body panels and floors and rockers or any place that you've got some rust, but you still have solid metal underneath and you wanna stop that rusting process. Also, it's a good idea to put some of that rust seal on the backside of new replacement panels. That way you don't have to mess with that down the road. And now, Seal Tech, brought to you by Steel Rubber Products, helping restore the car of your dreams. You know, when it comes to weather stripping and a restoration project, most people are familiar with door and window weather stripping and how to know when it's bad and how to replace it. But there are some areas of weather stripping that people don't talk about that much because it's not that fun and it's not that easy and most people don't even realize they need it. I'm talking about that rubber piece of filler that goes around a piece of glass and holds it in a metal frame. You're gonna find this on vent windows and roll up windows. Now the first questions that come up are, why do I need it, what is it, and why do I have to replace that? Those are good questions. Let's head over to the table because there's a lot going on here. If you take a close look down into this channel, you can see that the original rubber is cracked, part of it's missing, and it's allowing moisture down into that channel, which will eventually destroy that channel. If you take a close look at one that still has all the rubber on it, it's very obvious how hard and brittle that that rubber becomes. Also, if you are replacing the glass or if you're gonna restore the frames, well, all of this has to come out so you can have those re-chromed or painted. But before you can even get to this stage, there's a lot that needs to happen. Now the glass needs to be separated from the metal frame. And on a 40 or 50 year old vehicle, this can be a challenge. Generous amounts of penetrating lube will help soften the old rubber and plastic or rubber mallets, wood blocks, or a well-placed screwdriver might be needed to help persuade the metal to separate from the glass. Now obviously the object here is to not damage or break the glass or damage the metal channel. So take your time. Now once the pieces are separated, now you can look them over and assess what you have. If the metal channel or housing is rusty, replace it or repair it. If it needs to be restored or rechromed, now is the time to do it. If the glass is damaged or cracked or delaminating, now is the time to replace that as well. Okay, once all that is done and you're ready to put your channel back on your glass, now you're ready for your filler strip. And it does two things. First, it provides a seal between the channel and the glass and holds the channel in place. Second, it provides a barrier between the glass and the metal so there's no direct contact. Now, the strip comes in two different sizes, 1 32nd of an inch and 1 16th of an inch. 1 16th is the more common. And the goal here is to get enough of the filler strip in the channel to where it fits snugly down onto the glass and there's no movement. So, cut a piece of strip to the right length. You want it to overhang just a little bit, and then lay it on the glass in the center. Now, as you can see, this stuff is an inch and a half wide, so it's designed to hang about a half inch off either side of the glass. Now, when you come around some of these bins like this, usually you can just fold it in on itself, and it will tuck down, and you'll be able to still get the channel on. If by chance it gets too thick there and you have trouble getting the channel on, just some well-placed V-cuts will take care of that. But usually you don't have to do that. Then once you get it all fit onto the glass, give it a good shot of your soapy water and start putting your channel in place. You'll want to use a rubber mallet or a plastic mallet to help hammer it down on there. Next, just take a razor blade and cut off the excess rubber. And that's it. Ready to go back in the vehicle for another 30, 40 years.
And now, Parts Bin. In the world of tools, the general mindset has been to build up your tool collection and your toolboxes until you have a big wall of toolboxes. And there's nothing wrong with that except moving this big thing across the shop to work on that project over there can be a real pain in the butt. So what a lot of people do is they grab a toolbox more like this. But even this one filled up is really cumbersome to move back and forth across the shop. This is designed more for tool storage, not tool mobility. What you really need is something to shuttle the tools back and forth. That's what this is for. This is Cornwell's new Elite Series 29 inch tool cabinet. Take a look. As you can see, it has locking casters and 14 gauge steel construction, so it's tough and it's mobile. It has five drawers and the top four are rated at 120 pound capacity each and the bottom drawer will handle 200 pound capacity. So this thing will carry some weight and it's just the right height to give you a nice mobile work area so you can lay out what you need, roll it over to where you need to go and get to work. If you need some nice mobile tool storage and some work area, this elite cabinet from Cornwell is worth taking a look at. You don't have to look very far to see that square body Chevy trucks are hot. And with the run that spanned most of the 70s and 80s, there's still a lot of them on the road and a lot that are being restored. And that's where a Holley Classic Trucks comes in because they specialize in restoration parts for classic trucks, especially the square body Chevys. For example, if your seats are looking kind of bad, you can get brand new seat upholstery to rebuild that old bent seat. It's got the pleats in it, it's got the edging. You even get the hog rings and pliers. So you can put that old seat back together and relive those velour days. Also, if your grill is busted up, you can get replacement grills, both in original style or without trim, whichever way you want to go. And if your headlight bezels are cracked or busted, you can get those as well. If you have a 73 to 87 square body truck, you know it's cool. Now you can make it better with Holley Classic Trucks. There is no doubt that the first and second generation Camaros are some of the most popular cars out there to restore and drive. And if you're doing either, you know that eventually you're going to need some weather stripping. And that's where steel rubber comes in because they have this new door weather stripping for the first and second generation Camaros. Check this out. Now the first thing they've done is upgrade the materials like modern rubber. So this isn't going to rip. This isn't going to shrink and it's not going to fade on you. Then, as you can see, they have these molded end pieces that have brass inserts inside of them. So you're going to get strength and durability out of that. And then finally, as you can see, all of the pins are in place in the proper spacing. So there's no guesswork here. You just plug them in in place of the original pieces. So if you have a first or second generation Camaro, you probably want to drive it and enjoy it for a long time. Well, new door weather stripping can help make that happen. One of the best things about owning a Fox bodied Mustang is having a V8 and a stick in it. However, if you've ever had to mess with the old cable actuated clutch pedal, you know what a pain that can be. This sucker, come out of there. Well, American Powertrain has the solution we've all been asking for with this Hydromax hydraulic clutch system for the Fox bodied Mustang. Now check this out. The first thing that grabs you is you can see that there is a master cylinder with a special bracket and a brand new clutch pedal. And this is designed to bolt right in place of your stock pedal. Then of course you have the hoses and the shims and the hardware and the hydraulic release bearing that American Powertrain is so famous for. Then to get fluid back to this master cylinder, you have this billet reservoir that you can mount on the firewall or pretty much anywhere. The best part is this kit will work on any Tremec transmission from a T5 to a TKO to a T56 Magnum. So if you have a Fox bodied Mustang with a stick, you need this pedal. If you have a Fox bodied Mustang with an automatic, you still need this pedal so you can stick it. What are you working on? Brought to you by Woodward Fabrication, selling quality metalworking equipment since 1966. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Betty from Illinois, and it's about her husband Ed from Illinois. Now she says, my husband Ed has worked hard his entire life. 
He's 81 years old and he's still working part time. Now she said in 1971, he bought a brand new blazer. Oh man, that's awesome. And he said he mounted a snow plow on it and spent the next 37 years with a plowing business during the winter time using this blazer. Now she said that eventually he decided that he wanted to restore it. So in 2016, Ed started rebuilding it, wanted to keep it as original as possible. So the first thing he did was completely disassemble the truck. He pulled the body off, he blasted the frame and started building it back up. Now he said the wiring, the brakes, the fuel system, all of that needed to be restored, as well as the suspension, the steering, the <laughs> weather stripping, everything. This was a total rebuild from the ground up. Now, of course, the motor and the drivetrain were rebuilt and the old body was smoothed back out and painted the factory blue. And as you can see, what a great looking truck. Those were always one of my favorites. Now, she says at this point, she says, man, keep reminding people to get out there and keep working on stuff. It's never too late to start working on a project. That is great advice, Betty. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna encourage Ed to get back out there and get another project. And of course he can sell that blazer to me for a really reasonable price. Yeah, I know that's not gonna happen. All right, to recognize such a great project, we hooked up with the guys at Woodward Fab. We're gonna give you one of these shears so you can cut some metal for your next project. Also, we're gonna give you one of these deluxe project planning books so you can keep track of everything that you did on that project. Then we're gonna hook you up with a Holly gift card so you can pick up some products from Holly. And then we're gonna give you one of our new Copperhead t-shirts so you can wear that with pride. And finally, we're gonna give you one of these stunt double die casts because everybody needs a little off-road truck once in a while. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you want to get in on this and get your project featured on the show, you got to send it to us. Go to our website, go to Gears Nation, and submit it into What Are You Working On? The website's also the place to find out more information on any products you may have seen on the show, any Gears merchandise, and how to join Gears Nation. You can also see Gears episodes for free on our YouTube channel and become a channel member. That way you get bonus content and you get early access to all the new episodes. Also, don't forget to check us out on Amazon Prime for Gears and the Gears Restoration Series. Finally, don't forget to like us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you're a radio person, make sure you check out our podcast, Tales of a Gearhead. All right, that's it for us today. Obviously, Ed's got some stuff to work on. I got a ton of things to work on here, which means it's time for you to get out there, find yourself a project, and start working on it. We'll see you next time. Thank you.